Hi, I'm Adrian Saville. Thanks for joining me on day five of our lockdown vlog. Jess is away, uh, off in the world of low social distancing and the wilderness of homeschooling. So I thought I'd use the chance today to uh, respond to some comments and questions that have been put to us on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. And to everyone who has engaged with us, thank you. Uh, please keep sharing uh, and prompting and prodding. Uh, in no particular order or ranking or preference, there's four that I've picked up that I thought really speak to the environment and give us talking points uh, to pick up on. Uh, the first comes from uh, Zuleto Dlamini, uh, and he raises a question around corporate buybacks. Do they make sense in this environment and how do we square that up relative to uh, capital allocation amongst companies? Uh, the chart that I show you here is the size of corporate buybacks, share buybacks by companies in the United States versus the S&P 500. And what it makes quite clear is that as the S&P 500 has gone higher and higher, companies have been buying back more and more of their shares. <laughs> now, my dad tells me rule one of investing is buy low uh, and rule two is sell high. Corporates are doing the exact opposite. They are buying high. And as the S&P 500 has gone higher, they have bought even more. I mean, this is a common behavioral bias uh, where they are using uh, euphoria. They're using sentiment to guide their own decisions. It's a bad guide uh, and it's the wrong decision. So when share prices go higher, you should probably be thinking about selling. And when share prices go lower, you should probably be thinking about buying. And that's exactly what we would prefer to have seen in the corporate action of share buybacks. Instead of uh, buying as the S&P 500 goes higher, we prefer them to have held on to their cash. And now that share prices are much lower, it's now that we want them to be applying that cash. Of course, this is the benefit of hindsight. But what it doesn't take away is the fairly clear evidence that executives are using buoyancy in the S&P to guide their own investment decisions. It's the wrong marker. It's a poor guide. Uh, in a not entirely unrelated uh, question, Richard de Villiers says to me, what do I think about the United States? Look, our view on the US as an investment destination is, uh, I suppose this is rather pithy, but it's more attractive today than it was a few weeks ago. And that's because of the substantial uh, markdown in share prices. Of course, the environment has changed. But if we just put valuations uh, into, into the conversation, I want to show you one chart, which I think speaks volumes. And it's a comparison of the market cap of one company, one loved large listed US company, Apple, versus almost an entire country, the German market index, the DAX, which represents 30 large German companies, many of which have global footprint and substantial global competitiveness. Uh, Apple deserves an elevated valuation. It's a superb business with an extraordinary track record and great prospects. But we're not entirely convinced that one company uh, should overshadow the valuation of an entire country, particularly when you put into the analysis that the German DAX includes not just your automakers, uh, Daimler, Chrysler and BMW, uh, as well as your uh, air business, uh, Lufthansa. Those guys aren't having the best time of it. But it also includes chemicals businesses, which are critical to the healthcare environment, uh, some hospital businesses, healthcare insurers and financial services companies that have a global footprint and are increasingly digital. Uh, we think that at the very least, alongside Apple, there is a case for Germany uh, or the German DAX or specific German companies in your portfolio. So perhaps I've answered the US question, uh, Richard, without answering the US question. Uh, Mark Tobin uh, asks us about uh, South African government bonds and uh, are they attractive in this environment? Now, keeping in mind that this question is being posed in an environment where uh, government bonds in advanced countries are yielding 0, 1, 2 percent. So there is almost no yield available in 10, 20 year uh, government bonds. By contrast, 
South Africa's 10-year government bond is offering you a 12% yield. And that's up against 4% South African inflation. So this real yield, the 12 minus the 4, is one of the highest real yields globally. And so, Mark, you know, does that make for a great investment case? The short answer is yes. <laughs> the longer answer is, well, will inflation stay down at 4% and is government good for that 12% yield? I think those are the two critical components, leaving currency volatility aside just for the moment. Um, and the inflation one is probably the easier of the two to answer that we think that South African inflation hangs around very low rates for the foreseeable future. Uh, the second is arguably harder to answer and certainly in a short vlog, uh, impossible to answer. But the evidence that we've got in terms of South Africa's fiscus, the robustness of our policy system, our financial system, uh, the institutional strength of, of Treasury gives us every reason to believe that South Africa is good for that 12%. And so if we put a good for the 12% up against a relatively stable for inflation, we think South African government bonds make a really interesting uh, investment case in this environment. Uh, the current 12% yield, of course, needs to also be read against uh, the fact that government bonds not too long ago were yielding just 8%. Has the South African environment changed so spectacularly in the case of the past uh, three or four weeks? Yeah, it's deteriorated materially, uh, but it hasn't gone into the territory where uh, we think this 12 should be looked past. The fourth question uh, and last question that I'll uh, pick up on is from Dion Adams. Uh, we've had lots of uh, classroom uh, question and answer time. Uh, at Gibbs. So it's great to get your questions and comments here, Dion. Thank you. Uh, he says, hi, Prof. Thank you, Dion. Um, what do we think about governments using South African pensions uh, to uh, kickstart the, the economy? And perhaps there's two parts to, to a short answer. The first is uh, the effectiveness of any program of that sh sort would hinge on a the sense sensible the sensibility of the policy action. In other words, is it good sensible policy? And then secondly, the effectiveness of that policy implementation. If we can answer a great policy and good chance of effective implementation, then we've got a viable plan. Going on in the background, if I want to share this last chart with you today, and this shows you the size of South African pension funds versus uh, the size of the South African economy. We have one of the largest pension pools, certainly amongst emerging economies and indeed globally. We've got a substantial uh, pension fund asset that is available uh, to help with a New Deal type program in South Africa. Uh, if we reach for that pension fund uh, pot, the sensibility, the sensibleness of that plan must hinge on the level-headedness of the policies and the likelihood of them being effectively implemented. I think we have to assess our belief uh, in that on an individual basis, but all put together, recognize that there is a silver lining here in a very dark economic environment. There is a prospect here to bring a material financial asset to help an economy that is battling, but it hinges on the sensibleness of the policies and the effectiveness of their implementation. Dion, I know you've got views on that. Uh, others will have too. Please share with, us, uh, sh share with us, engage with us, connect with us and share with others. We look forward to seeing you on day six of lockdown.